Our second speaker. So, um, this will be led by Christopher Boyton. So, a big round of applause for our second speaker. So, hi everyone. My name is Chris. Um, I'm from um, Avanade actually. So, just to give you a background, Avanade is the Microsoft capability of Accenture. So, I've been with Accenture for uh, four years now. And my role for, uh, under Avanade is to be the solutions architect for um, uh, the DevOps capability, or rather the uh, PMM. I'm also joined by uh, my team here. Uh, we have two technical architects here, by Justin Go, and we have uh, Fred Fabregas, and we also have a DevOps engineer. Uh, he's, uh, he's there over there, Keith. And again, welcome to Accenture. So, um, so what is DevOps? This is a very good um, uh, uh, definition of Mr. Donovan Brown from Microsoft. So he says that DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. So again, as a uh, the uh, Microsoft capability, uh, it is our um, goal to create assets and um, to uh, enable the uh, the delivery team. Uh, with these assets for uh, uh, the, the assets that we are making, so that uh, it will have a um, have a faster delivery in uh, in in uh, the, yeah the delivery teams. Now, uh, I'm not going. Um, actually, we are also um, working together with uh, the DCSC or the uh, beta team. So we are, we are actually under one umbrella, which is called the DCSC. Um, so basically, ADOC is the uh, the open study. Um, they're actually on the uh, focus us is on the uh, open source tools. While of course, um, AMAP is uh, for catering uh, the uh, Microsoft centric tools. So let's go uh, forward with the processes. So what we have here are the, the different processes for uh, application development. So as you can see here uh, at the top row, we have the uh, uh, the, the dev processes. So that's uh, covering from scrum management to development. Testing, source code management, continuous integration, and continuous deployment. Uh, and then at the uh, um, the second row represents the ops um, processes, which uh, focuses on application system monitoring, environment provisioning, environment maintenance, service management, security system, and service analytics uh, dashboards. So as you can see, um, actually dev and ops um, that uh, what I call this. Um, uh, uh, Anyway, uh, 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 usually the that um, the, the, the transition, yeah, the transition from uh, dev and ops usually starts at the uh, application deployment. So, um, as we all know that uh, in the uh, the usual um, deployment for uh, the delivery teams is that after the delivery team or the de the de uh, development team is finished with the uh, application pa uh, package. They pass the application pa uh, package going to the tech art team or the operations team, so that they will be the ones going to uh, to, to deploy the uh, uh, application package uh, going to uh, the target environments. So, um, uh, yeah. So the point here with DevOps is that uh, we want uh, one of the goals of DevOps is to marry the, the, the two processes together. We want to streamline the processes so that uh, it will reach uh, so that we can give more value to the end users. So if I line, uh, line these processes uh, up together, okay, and here are the tools and assets to drive efficiency and innovation. So these are actually the products that will enable DevOps for each processes. So as, um, I'm sure what, what we are seeing here is the Microsoft-centric tools, is, or also known as AMEM. It's just the branding that we are uh, 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 saying uh, for the Microsoft-centric tools. So um, AMEM stands for Accenture Modern Engineering Platform. So as you can see here, um, uh, um, Microsoft, one of the, uh, the good thing about Microsoft is that uh, uh, they, they have this one big system 
uh, most of the, uh, usually they, they create this one big system so that it will be uh, more, uh, uh, I mean, it can cover uh, the different processes here. So, uh, uh, okay, so I apologize, uh, apologize because uh, I think it's a little bit blurry, but actually it, this uh, blue thing here stands for Team Services. It's actually Visual Studio Team Services. It's the, uh, the cloud version of the uh, of Team Foundation Server. So as you can see, um, VSTS uh, is a DevOps tool that is being used for the dev, uh, most of the dev um, processes. And we also have, uh, uh, of course, Microsoft had, had, had started embracing um, open source tools as well. So as you can see here, we're now also using SonarCube as, uh, as a tool for um, testing and quality. We are also making use of um, ServiceNow for service management and so on and so forth. Now, um, since we are also working under one umbrella with DCSE, and since uh, Microsoft has started embracing open source tools, we can see here that um, the open source tools here is almost the same. I mean, for open source tools, they have uh, these uh, different tools that caters, uh, that enables DevOps for uh, the different processes. Um, the message here is that uh, we can actually integrate uh, uh, the different uh, tools from, let's say, if we do not, uh, if a client or a project team has a different uh, tool set, like for example, they are using um, uh, Java um, applications, we can actually um, uh, integrate Eclipse with um, Visual Studio Team Services. And of course, if, um, for example, if the, if the team uh, team project is already using Jenkins. Team Foundation Server or the, uh, VSPS has the ability to um, also integrate or call a Jenkins server in order to run a uh, continuous integration and uh, automated deployment. Also through the uh, uh, through the Jenkins server. Now, um, before I continue, do you have any questions with regards to this slide? If you have hard questions, I'm going to just refer you to our technical. So this one's just like the uh, yes. using Microsoft. Yes, so that is the, uh, the main point here. So the architecture is actually the same. So um, to move forward, what is uh, AMEP? So AMEP overview is, uh, so, uh, sorry, let me just get my cue card here. So, uh, AMAP is Accenture Modern Engineering Platform. It is a platform that uh, jumpstarts development projects by minimizing the setup time. It automates the deployment of infrastructure, configuration, and application while integrating DevOps practices and applications into uh, one solution. So as you can see here, we have that in um, IDC here. Uh, it is being powered by Azure. Uh, it's the platform, the Microsoft Cloud uh, Platform, of course. We have um, our templates here, which uh, stands for the uh, the different um, uh, uh, configuration, uh, rather the uh, yeah, right, the, the different um, configurations of the virtual machines or resources under the um, Azure uh, Cloud uh, provision. And then we also have a, a, a scripting tool here, which is called the PowerShell. And then we also have some orchestration framework. So this is uh, uh, the, either the EFS or the Visual Studio Team Services. And with the use of um, build and release definitions, which comes in the form of uh, a JSON file. So it's just a uh, list of uh, the tasks to be done by the, the, the TFS or PSDS. Now we also have here the project release. It's an application framework which the um, uh, have a capability also uh, uh, created. Uh, Project Hermes is just an application that runs, uh, that is created with um, um, ASP.NET and MVC, with AngularJS, and it also um, uh, has a, a WCF um, uh, web service, which also communicates with uh, the MSSQL. And then we bundle that together with uh, some DevOps uh, practices, and that is actually the, um, the entirety of the AMM cartridges. So we can see here that we have um, ASP.NET cartridge. Uh, we also have created the ASP.NET containers uh, cartridge. 
and we also have a side for purpose. So again, um, going back to the presentation of Krishka, uh, he also mentioned that they have uh, the, the, uh, the different uh, cartridges. It's all, also the same concept or same architecture with um, AMET. So we, we created these cartridges so that the, uh, the, uh, the clients or project teams can uh, make use of them so that uh, so we are actually um, uh, speeding up the development uh, uh, the development uh, team. So uh, there we go. So for this um, demo, I'm going to show, uh, we're going to talk about ASP.NET cartridge. So this is the architecture diagram for uh, our modern GNN platform. So everything starts with the command center. So the command center is uh, a combination of uh, our Azure Azure uh, subscription. It's uh, called the Ava EDC DevOps. And we also have the um, uh, storage account for uh, uh, living in, in, the, uh, in our Azure subscription. So it stores the different cartridges that we are going to be uh, uh, copying or uh, yeah, copying into the, uh, uh, the different Azure subscriptions also. So, so as it, um, what, we got, what we are doing here is that the core is going to be um, deployed first through the uh, command center. So the command center is actually just like a script. Uh, it's a PowerShell script, which I will be showing later uh, after this uh, uh, slides. And from the uh, from the command center, it will start provisioning the core. The core is a set of components of MVP, uh, including the domain controller, the team foundation server, the health server, and the sonar queue. Um, and then um, after the uh, after that is being uh, uh, provisioned in the Azure uh, subscription, it's going to. Uh, we're going inside the Team Foundation server in order to load a cartridge. So for this example, um, a cartridge is again it's a uh, it's a group of um, virtual machines and technology specific components of of um, MVP, including the application server, the server, uh, the development uh, machines, and the test machines, and that is being um, loaded into the from the core. Do you have any questions? No. Okay. Let's move forward. So I just want to, to uh, uh, explain what is a cartridge. So, so cartridge is just uh, actually a zip file. It's just a zip file that contains these three folders or these uh, three layers. So we have the application um, layer, the infrastructure layer, and the orchestration layer. So yeah, uh, in, inside the application, uh, we have, of course, the, the demo application um, uh, project. So the app folder contains the ASP.NET and basic project. It contains the uh, web service project. It also contains the SQL database project, the unit test project, the code UI or automated UI test project, and the web performance project. For the infrastructure uh, folder, we have the uh, web and SQL server, the, uh, the Visual Studio machine, and the test um, agent machine. So these are actually the ARM templates or the Azure Resource Manage, uh, Manage, Azure Management Manager, Azure Azure Resource Manager uh, templates. So templates in a sense that they are also JSON files, which just um, uh, have these uh, different configurations according to Azure, and then. Um, Basically, it's a class of the of, a, of, a, of the machine, and then it also contains the uh, desired state configuration um, scripts, which will um, after after uh, provisioning the VM, of course, it's just a uh, uh, vanilla VM, and then after that, you're, we are going to uh, con further continue uh, further configure that VM according to its role. So, for example, the role of the VM is a uh, development machine. So after after provisioning a VM as standard Windows Server uh, machine, it will now um, download uh, Visual Studio. Uh, it will now install and configure uh, Visual Studio IDE. It will also uh, configure the different um, other components such as maybe uh, Node.js or Notepad Plus Plus or something like that. And then of course the test machine. Uh, if you need a test machine, so we will be installing and configuring uh, a Google Chrome web browser. Inside a, uh, inside a test machine or even a Firefox uh, browser. And then lastly, the orchestration folder contains the JSON files of the build and release definitions to be used by the, uh, the orchestrator, which is the Visual Studio Team Service or TFS. So 
basically the architecture here is that everything was made as a code. So we have application as a code, infrastructure as a code, and orchestration as a code. So there. So this is the detailed architecture overview, or this is going to be the, uh, the, the flow of our demo. So what we have here is the core. So again, uh, it's a group of uh, foundation servers, which has the uh, domain controller, the foundation server, LSAT, and the solar cube. And then inside the thing, uh, the foundation server, uh, we have the different actions here. But before I discuss about that, we, uh, over the, to the right, we have the cartridge. The cartridge contains uh, the application server, the development machine, and the test machine. So everything starts with the development machine, where the uh, the developer will check in will check in uh, a change in the code. So when it checks in the, the change in the code, Team Foundation Server will now um, uh, it, a build. What that? Okay. So it will now uh, proceed with the automated build. After um, building the application source code, it will also perform the unit test. And then after that, it would prepare the application package and it would now create a release. So for the release, it will deploy the web application and the web API going to the application server. And of course, it will also deploy the uh, database. Um, after that is done, uh, it is going to uh, perform functional testing where it will deploy the test agent, which will now control the test machine. For, for this example, we are going to make use of Google Chrome, and it will now uh, run the automated UI test, and it will hit the, uh, 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 the web application server. And then after that, it will also perform the load testing. So for this example, we have, of course, the, uh, we are going to make use of our uh, Visual Studio Team service, uh, or the Visual Studio Online. It will perform cloud load performance test through, uh, through cloud. And it will uh, perform uh, yeah, uh, load testing on the web application. Do you have any questions with regards to this uh, architecture? Yes. Uh, when, like for example, different developers, right? So uh, how do you figure when the build would start? Upon commit or is it a regular schedule? What would be your advice to your client? OK, so again, um, so, uh, in practice, each developer has their own a development machine, yes. and then they have their own branch, right? Development branch. So, for example, they're doing their own um, uh, changes in their own um, yeah. uh, in their own machines, and then if they're going to check in their code, it will go through the uh, uh, let's say the development branch first. Yes. Um, let's say that it gets queued up. Um, everything gets queued up. So. Uh, we have a master build machine here, so it will perform. So, uh, what do you call this? Uh, first come, first serve. So it will. Uh, it, uh, for uh, the first developer who gets gets to check in his code, uh, that will uh, the build machine will perform on that uh, on that certain uh, change, and then uh, after that, it uh, it next it goes to the next queue, and then it will also perform the next build. So. We're just doing the build here. So after, uh, for example, uh, if the development work for the day is already complete, let's say uh, we can have a scheduled build where, let's say, uh, end of the day build, which will now trigger, uh, let's say, end of the day, it will trigger another build for the whole entire uh, build, and then, or rather, it will now uh, merge into the, uh, the master branch, and then it will perform building, and then it will also perform the the uh, actual deployment going to the target uh, environment. So there, did I answer the question? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, do you have any other questions? No? Okay. So let's go for Ah, let's go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, there's a question. There's a question. I see that this is only for coaching. Mm -hmm. like database changes. Uh, database changes, okay. Uh, Again, uh, we ha also have. Uh, I'll show you. Okay. The point with what we're trying to build here is that everything is code. Cool. Different database is code. Cool. Yeah. So if, we go, if, we, if we're just making changes on the database, the intent here is to don't change the database directly. Rather, you change the database project. You make your changes there, then you deploy with the pipeline. 
So everything gets checked into TFS, everything is version controlled, everything runs through the build and release, everything is run through the, the validation pipeline. So yeah, then you can definitely make your changes on the database, then just get Visual Studio to connect to the database and pull the changes out into code. Right? So you, you can you can still have that, but the point here really is everything is code. Everything is TFS handles everything. So put into the pipeline, right? Yes. Yeah. So it, 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 it is being packaged, packaged which yeah. is called the DAC pack. So database, uh, what is it? I, I forgot. The, the, For example, all the reference stable. Yes, all yeah. those the schema, the yeah. schema. Yeah, it gets applied. So it's, uh, the database <coughs> as a project is just a, what do you call this? Uh, I forgot. So, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 SQL. Ah, you know. yeah. Declarative model. There we go. So it's a declarative model. So it's um, whatever you do with the with the, uh, the the model of your database. When you get uh, when you push it, then that's the time that it will apply the changes to your actual database. Does it actually drop the whole thing the database and It really depends on your configuration. Um, you can you can configure it uh, according to your uh, how you want it to be. So you can. Drop the uh, if you want to drop the whole table, you can do that. Or if you can, if you wanted to apply the changes only, then that is also possible with uh, Microsoft SQL database projects. So, any other questions? None. Okay. So to the, let's go to the actual demo. So what I'm going to do here is just I'm just. I'm just going to play a video. So, for the interest of time, we've already uh, we've already prepared uh, a demo video for the uh, the actual um, provisioning of the port and for the actual uh, loading of the cartridge of AM. Okay, so as you can see here, this is Azure Resource Ad. This is Azure. This is our Azure subscription. Uh, we can see here that I am currently filtering EDC dash dev zero one. It's just a name. Uh, it's the uh, uh, naming convention that we've come up with uh, for uh, for ident identifying the resource groups. So um, the the point here is that I'm currently looking for PDC dash uh, dev zero one, and the Azure subscription is telling me that there's no such um, resource group yet. So what I'm going to do, we're going to call, uh, we're going to execute the um, AMAP um, command center. So again, it's just a uh, PowerShell script which we, uh, the user will just um, input the, the uh, answer these bunch of questions. So what we have here is the uh, the first. Um, to the, the first two um, questions refers to the business name and the environment name. Uh, I can, as you can see here, I've already inputted PDC, that's zero one, and I'm just going to um, uh, leave the others blank as I'm going to make use of the, uh, the default values for that. For this question, I'm just going to input the target um, subscription name. So we can see here that I am actually targeting uh, our own um, Microsoft Azure subscription. And of course, I need the, uh, the, the user the account, the administrator account, for uh, the provisioning of the, uh, of the, uh, what do you call it? the uh, different VMs for, to be used by the core. So after this, uh, the core, the provisioning of the core usually takes about, uh, about an hour. But uh, again, for the filters of time, We've already skipped that part, and as you can see here, uh, let's say after one hour, when I click on the refresh button, it will now show me the different these uh, VMs, which uh, that is the core. So uh, again, this is the domain controller, the deep boundary server, the Sonar Q um, server, the L uh, server, and uh, Overfly. So Overfly is just is a new server for us. It's about service uh, virtualization, but we're not going to actually use that in this demo. So. Um, now I'm going to load the cartridge. So in order for me to load the cartridge, I'm going to go inside the uh, team company server by just uh, using the friendly DNS name of the, uh, uh, all right, right. So PFS has its own uh, web portal, so we can just go in there and click on browse. And then we also have, uh, OK, 
Okay, so the Team Foundation server, by the way, I forgot to mention that it's a special Team Foundation server uh, image. Or, yeah, it's a uh, special server because we've um, actually configured it, it already. And it comes with this um, uh, built-in project, which is called the uh, Phoenix project. Inside the project, it contains the uh, a special load cartridge mechanism. It's also a build definition, actually, technically. And as you can see here, it, it already has the load cartridge build definition. What I'm, I'm going to do is just uh, queue a new build, or just to load the cartridge by queuing a new build for, on this build definition. And when I do that, it will pop up a new for, uh, a pop up window, and it will ask me these uh, uh, um, important questions again. So what we have here is the cartridge name. So I'm going to be using the .NET or ASP.NET um, cartridge. We can change this into um, container cartridge or site core, depending on the cartridge that we are going to use. And then we are also going to um, input the, the, the correct uh, business unit and environment names. So for this example, I'm using pvc dev one So I'm just going to make the change over here, dev one And everything is uh, good to go. So I'm just going to click on the OK button. So after that, it will now load the cartridge. It will download the cartridge from the uh, storage account. Uh, it will, like what I said, uh, the cartridge is just a zip file, right? So it will download the zip file, the cartridge. It will extract that cartridge. And then it will also um, uh, configure the build definition and the release definition. And it will check in the code into the PFS. So again, for the iterations of time, it usually takes about a week to two or three minutes to finish. So we've skipped that part for one and a half minutes. So uh, we expect that a new build definition will um, appear and a new release definition. And of course, the cartridge or the like that, the cartridge as a code is already checked in into the uh, Team Foundation server or into the source control manager of the uh, PFS. So when I click on the all definitions, we can see here that the .NET build is over there. And when we go to the uh, code tab, we can see here that the cartridge uh, folder is also um, uh, checked in inside the LPFS. So again, this is the .NET cartridge, the, 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 the architecture that I've uh, also mentioned a while ago. And then it also contains the release manager, uh, release definition uh, for the .NET. So to continue, I'm just going to do a new build for the .NET build. And it will um, perform a build on the demo application. So it will perform build. It will perform uh, solar tube analysis. It will perform uh, unit testing. It will also perform uh, unit testing for the uh, PowerShell scripts. And then again, for the interest type, it usually takes about 3.7 minutes. It will um, uh, prepare the packaging of the application itself. And then it will copy the app, uh, package, app, uh, package, application package going to the, uh, to the repository of, uh, at least a repository of DFS to be consumed by release definition. After the build definition finishes, it usually uh, uh, shows the different results. So we have here the test results of the unit test. It also shows the results of the uh, code coverage for that demo application. Um, further down, it will show the sonar cube analysis report, which we can uh, click on that, and it will get redirected to the um, application, uh, to the sonar cube report server to see the results. And, and after that, of course, we've also configured that the build definition and the release definition is already uh, implementing continuous deployment and continuous integration. So, ah, sorry, uh, vice versa. CICD, so. Uh, it will perform continuous deployment after the, after the successful build. So for the build, uh, for the release, it will um, it will now uh, provision the the VMs the, the, the VMs of the cartridge. So again, it, it consists of the uh, the application server, the development machine, and and the test machine. So this usually takes about 40 minutes to finish. So again, for the interest of time. We've got that short. 
and the release definition is uh, also going to perform uh, uh, deployment of the application, uh, deployment of the, the, the database into the application server. It will also um, deploy the uh, the web application into the server, and it will also uh, perform automated UI testing and automate uh, and load testing. So there we go. So after that, uh, we expect that when we go back to the Azure um, subscription for the web portal, when I click on the refresh button, I should see here that the uh, three new servers has appeared. So this is the uh, servers for the application or the cartridge for the cartridge cartridge group. So when I click on the DNS, the friendly DNS name of the um, application server, I should see now that the uh, uh, project release or the uh, application, uh, the uh, demo application, web application is also published here in our uh, uh, web application server. So changed by the developer. So everything is actually ready. So I'm just going to comment in that uh, part of code and I'm just going to perform a check-in. Okay, so we also have some check-in policies over here that, that was already set. So I need to enter a comment, a check-in comment. So I'm just going to say add contact plus button. And then I'm going to uh, add a work item for that, which is uh, add contact plus button. So I'm going to perform the check-in, and this should uh, trigger uh, an automated build. We can check that out by going back to the home button over here, and I, if I go to the builds tab over here, we can see here that the uh, this blue uh, square here is already queuing, uh, it's, it's, it had triggered uh, a build in DFS. So to check, in order for us to actually check that uh, I'm going inside the project currently, uh, project, uh, Phoenix project, uh, project, and I'm going to the build tab, and you can see here that it, it is already in progress. And if I uh, click on that, and uh, oops, wait a minute. So as you can see here on the left side, uh, these are the different tasks being done by the build definition. It has already uh, built the application, has performed the unit testing, it, has, it is now preparing the um, application packaging. And if I go to the release tab, I hope that I can make it in line before it finishes. So uh, this is the list of the release uh, of the releases, ongoing releases. So right now there's no ongoing release um, happening over here. So we can see here that the build has succeeded. So if I click on the refresh button over here, nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> different um, uh, tasks to be done by the application. So going back over here at the, uh, the website, so there's no change yet. So we'll wait, let's wait uh, a few minutes for uh, the release definition to reach the, uh, the actual deployment of the application package going to uh, the, uh, the target, um, what do you call it, the target application service. So any moment now. Uh, yeah, so it's deploying. 
after the deploy, the application uh, deployment, it will also perform automated UI testing. But um, even if it's already performing the application uh, at the automated UI test, we can actually um, check out the uh, the, the uh, website already after that. So yeah, we've uh, finished the deployment of the web application. And if I click on the refresh button, and should now, should now, uh, uh, we should see the change that was applied in our source code. And there we go, yeah. So we have the contact us button. So if I click on the contact us button, we have the contact us functionality. So there we go, that's the demos. Uh, thank you, thank you. In case there's a failure in the UI test, uh, we can uh, uh, for the uh, let's go back to the PFS. Okay, so what we have here are the uh, the listing of the different releases that we've already done in the past. So what we can do is just uh, go back to the um, previous release and click a release on that instead. So that para para ito yung roll back on that. But um, again, we can uh, for this demo we didn't uh, do it that way. But it is possible that we can uh, perform uh, a rollback. So, for example, in the automated UI task, I can say that uh, maybe through PowerShell that um, when the UI test fails, it should it should uh, trigger the a release uh, or rather the the most what it, uh, 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 the most recent uh, good release, something like that. So it's just a matter of uh, reconfiguration of the whole processes. So again, DevOps is actually very challenging because uh, you need to know the processes and that, that will suit the, 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 the different um, uh, businesses now. So there, that, that's how would I, uh, would I say, I mean, how I would provide solution for that. Uh, do you have any other questions? Yes, sir. Is there something available for this? this is right. Do we have an answer for that? Uh, the, the question is depending on the thing is about configurations. So yeah, that is also possible. It's cool. Yeah, configuration. Everything is cool. All right. So it's part of the GSC script. It's part of the script that actually configures the server. There's a lot of modules out there that actually configures a uh, server. There's modules that configures Active Directory. There's modules that configure SharePoint. There's one that configures almost any aspect of Windows. And the beauty here is that you don't configure it on the server, you configure it in code. And then if you want to replicate, you just run the release. Right? You're not restricted with just running a change for your application. If you want to change the infrastructure, you change the infrastructure code. You run the release, Microsoft will detect there's a change between the template and the actuals. It will apply that change. Okay. Any other questions? If none, maybe I can. Uh... Uh, yeah, yes, sir. How long have you guys been using this, uh, this platform? A year. A year. Yeah. It's, it's just year. fresh, fresh from the. Uh, How long did it take? A year. To build? Um, no, actually about two months with the power of just the code. Oh, okay. <laughs> the power of the code. I mean, a lot of the, the majority of the work, mm. a lot of the parenting job, like the family is part like. It's already provided by TFS. What we just did is we just put our own flavor on top of it. We just made it our own, our, our own, right? But we need to get everything set up, like the bare minimum to have build pipeline, to have release pipeline, to have work item down, to have source control. All of those, all of those is just offered by one, one technology, TFS. Or BSDS depends if you want to go with IS or PASS. But it's still just one technology. And the reason with that is it's just one point, right? Uh, the one thing that I really like about the FS that actually Chris is actually able to show is that there's it, I manage everything from the FS, my work items, my build, my release, my source control. The best thing about that is visibility, right? I can offer all of my 
my work items in TFS. Then, for disability sake, I can enforce a policy. Every time you check in, you need to map it back to the specific work item that you're working on. And that, that will track you from the source code commits all the way to the build, all the way to the release. So I know for this server that run through this specific release, which specific work item was to be acted upon. Right? And that's that's what I really like about TFS. And yeah, because it's it's a single point of uh, it's a singular technology that tries to integrate everything in just this one platform. It makes it easier. It makes it a lot easier to work with. Can I go so? Okay, so any other questions? No. Okay, so let me uh, give the floor back to our moderators. Ah, yes, sir. I know. Uh, we have a question over here. What is the usual problem or the less problem that I encounter in Athens? Sometimes updates. I don't know. <laughs> uh, sometimes the updates. Of course, uh, there is still we, we still need to introduce maintainability for this uh, platform. But of course, uh, for example, we had one um, problem where let's say there's a, a an update in the uh, in the Selenium packaging. Uh, when I ran the demo, it it failed because I wasn't able to update the the, the um, civilian packaging, but of course it's a, a, an easy an easy fix because um, uh, we just need to update the packaging. Again, it's just about maintainability. Uh, yeah. Okay. No. That's so did I answer your question? Yeah. Those uh, sometimes um, yeah maintainability. Sometimes it could be also lead to scalability. So um, scale for scalability. Um, again, this demo. Um, the purpose of this demo is just about. Uh, uh, everything is a package already. So sometimes, uh, about scalability, in a, in a sense that uh, we haven't made it in a, in a way that we can pro pro provision uh, several development machines again in, in, in just one go. So we, we still need to, that's one of um, um, the uh, items, tasks, items that we need uh, to work on in our backlog where we wanted to introduce scalability. Uh, Hosting costs. Uh, Microsoft is very happy with us. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah, yeah. Well, but of course it's the quality of the work that we are getting here is that in exchange for that uh, uh, the costing. <laughs> but you have uh, free trials and you know, free licenses for us. I think five people. Um, that's there. Yes, sir. Yeah, I see. You're, you did a good job on presenting the uh, process side, right? So everything is working. But also there's another component: it's the people. And you mentioned a while ago you have the Scrum, Scrum team. And Scrum. Team. So how do you kind of operate the, the processes and your team to kind of work together? So give us a typical day or typical deployment or a typical discussion on how you execute to roll out a particular project. The concept that I have a dev team and an ops team, that's not what we're trying to do. But it's DevOps, right? You don't have a dev team and an ops team, you have a DevOps team. It's, it's a team that both handles the development work of your application, that then also handles the operation work as well, right? But to alleviate some of the stress from the operations work, you're, we're implementing all of these automation automation pipelines, right? So the, the reason for this is who's, who is better uh, to actually configure infrastructure, who is better who has full knowledge of the application that needs to be hosted is the developer, right? So, since they already have that information, and since you have all of this tooling, it's might as well, it's might as well that we get the developers to actually write code that defines the infrastructure that they need, right? So it's not how do we transition the how do we transition? It's just one thing. There's no transitioning you need to do, right? Of course, there will be situations that there's going to be walls, but that's a different use case. Sorry. That's not something that that will that. Uh, that DevOps is really happy about. In some situ in most situations, we are forced to handle those types of information. But yeah, ultimately, in the end, what we're trying to do is get the developers to check in and then get automated tools to do what to do what it does, right? And the beauty with having everything as as code is that you're typically coupling your infrastructure version with your application version as well. If you're adding a new dependency on your application, then 
you will add that dependency also on your code. And since both have to start code, it's just one code, it's just one version. It's tightly coupled, right? So if I want to roll back, I have a, I have the specific infrastructure that I need. Right? It's just one source. Code. Okay. So how do you guys work with? You have clients that have in-house IT teams, right? I mean, any of your clients that you deploy these solutions to today, or you have mm -hmm. like system admins. Yeah. There. How do you integrate? deployment of this with your existing. I think that's kind of what you're yeah. driving at, right? Yeah. That's going to be you know, the, where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, because yeah. if, if I'm an IT guy, like, okay, what are you guys doing with my shop? Like, yeah, yeah. Well, ultimately, uh, I, think, I, could, I think they could let you, let you go on the development environment, but yeah. once you go to your OED, that's a different thing. You know? Yeah, and I think the main problem there is about credentials, right? They don't want to share their credentials for production. Ah, uh, the, the credentials and sometimes a lot, a lot they don't want. Well. Yeah, and that's why in a lot of our applications as well, uh, they don't typically let us go to production. It's always up to pre prod then. Well, at that point, uh, we already have the package already tested, so they can just download it from TFS and get let them to download it themselves. Or sometimes we can also have a pipeline that is not automatically triggered, get them to actually trigger it, or put in some approval processes. Like uh, again, this. TFS, you can have pre-deployment approval, post-deployment approval, you can have manual steps. So you can you can inject all of these steps that will pause the automation pipeline to get people to actually verify and basically just build up some confidence over the package that has been prepared by the build pipeline and basically get someone on their side to actually do the final yes, complete this deployment and start the deployment to production. Now in terms of the credentials, uh, one thing with DFS is that we don't actually have to share credentials. They have a mechanism that will let, that will handle the credentials for you, the service endpoint. So if you want to, you can let DFS handle the credentials for you. The developers will never be able to see that credentials. And in DFS, if you tell DFS to start encrypting the credentials, it will never let the developers see that credentials. So there's still that separate region. So if you have environments that um, requires these high-level credentials, but you need the developers to start working on it, TFS will not share it, but it will still let the developers play in the server, but they will never see the credentials. Um, so, ultimately, how we do it is, if we can, we set up a pipeline, but we set a lot of policies. If not, then we just see what they allow us to do. And ultimately, then, if, if they say, I want a DevOps process, but I want you to never touch our servers, I, I don't, that's something that I don't think we can work with. I mean, the fact that they're not letting us touch your infrastructure, I mean, yeah. Sometimes you get requests that just build the pipeline, put it in this folder, we'll handle the rest. Ultimately, what we try to answer is that's not DevOps. Where's the release pipeline? Where's the, what, yeah. what, 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 what value are you trying to get from us, right? In that case, there's very minimal, you're just automating the build. But what's the step? I mean, it's very easy to just build it in Visual Studio, right? So ultimately, that's the question that we try to raise to them. What really, what value are you trying to get from this, right? And there are some restrictions that you have that will prevent you from getting this value, but that's something that we have to talk about. Um, to add on that, no? so again, DevOps is the union of people, products, and processes. So it all starts with the people. Uh, it's a cultural change. So we are all, uh, you know, uh, getting, we're used to this type of uh, process. No? So it has to come uh, first with the people. It has the, the change has to come with the people. So with the people, um, they need to embrace the change. Then they need to, you know, uh, um, adapt on that uh, certain change. So that is what uh, DevOps is trying to see or to, to, to fix. So with that, uh, if you have, uh, do you have any other questions from the audience? Yes, John. Okay, let us just uh, 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 the floor to our moderator. Thank you very much, guys.